Hello and welcome to the second video of our series of conversations on youth participation, a series of discussions on youth political engagement, activism and youth rights in times of crises. For this second episode, we have the pleasure of having with us Sotfa Daji from the European Network of Migrant Women. Sotfa, hello, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So Sotfa, you are a feminist activist working across Africa and Europe. And within the European network of migrant women, you lead the capacity building and the self-organizing activities of young women and girls. And aside from your engagements with the network, you are also the co-chair of the largest pan-African youth-led grassroots organization, uh, the Africa Youth Movement, and you also founded uh, an Italian NGO. And on top of all of this, you study political science and theology. Thank you very much for being with us today. We know that your time is very precious. So thanks. Thank you. And uh, Thank you. taking part in this discussion as well, we have two of our colleagues, respectively from the European Free Alliance, IFA, and from the European Free Alliance Youth, Dejan and Adrian. Hello and welcome. Hello, hi there. Hi. Dayan, you are a political advisor uh, for IFA, prior to which you worked in the European Parliament, and you are an activist yourself, um, engaged in the Welsh independence movement. And as such, you were involved in the European Free Alliance youth branch in the past. And Adrian, you are currently the coordinator of the youth branch of IFA, and you are Basque and have long been involved in um, youth movements, campaigning for a peaceful and democratic self-determination for the Basque Country and beyond. Thank you both for taking part in this discussion. And the first question comes from Dayan. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Sadva, for joining us today. Um, so now you're based in Italy, um, which, as we know, was uh, hit very hard by the pandemic uh, very early on and also saw um, the state impose some very restrictive measures um, on the people there. So how is this uh, context of uh, lockdown and being in isolation, how has that affected the nature of uh, your work and your activism uh, and also the young women you support as well. Um, how are you maintaining your links with them? Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I think we realized with this global pandemic that we, our work is based in a very weak system. Uh, I, I've been hearing in the past months that we are all turning online and switching our work remotely, but it's not that easy. Because first of all, despite being, I would say, in a developed continent like Europe, we still face an issue, which is the digital divide, and we need to recognize it. So uh, one of the major challenges myself, my colleagues, we have faced is indeed the digital divide. And it's even harder when you work with refugee young women. Uh, it's even harder when you work with young women with disabilities who often are unable to use technological devices for their health. So I think this is something that um, we have recognized our limitation. What if something like this pandemic happens again? How do we make sure that we keep a continuous and organic engagement? But unfortunately, this narrative it's not just related to our own work, but it's a little bit in the entire development sector. I think each organization tried its best to move the work online, but the reality is that we have left a lot of people behind. And if there is something that this pandemic has shown is that we are able to work within a global solidarity. We are able to develop strategies and action plan which are borderless. We are able to think in a global perspective, which is amazing. We have shown that we are able to do so and to really bring our work to another level. However, we have this main issue, which is in a digitalized world, 
what does it take to make sure that no one is left behind in the digital conversation? And then, of course, there's also the intergenerational aspect, uh, what it means for the elder people. Have we been able to support elder women? And in my field as migrant and refugees, have we been able to support elder migrant and refugees? And the response, unfortunately, is not. So... Um, when it comes to young women, majority of them, of course, are digitally connected and we try to bring in our capacity and build safe spaces to make sure they can share their stories, their concerns, but even more their analysis on how the pandemic has affected women's rights, but also their engagement in the youth space. Uh, but the peculiar concern to me and to my colleagues was the fact that we had left a lot of people behind. And... We have seen that not in all spaces we had this honest conversation and assessment about uh, what's next for migrant and refugees. We spoke a lot about making sure that measures are okay, that self-isolation is good, that everything, the measures are respected, but we didn't speak about their freedom and their right to access the digital space, to stay informed. And, um, and maybe that's something that... That's, I think, the main conversation we had in the past months. Um, so, yeah, honestly, as a fair assessment, it was difficult to maintain the link with the people we work with. Oh, thank you very much. It was very interesting, um, particularly how, you know, the digital divide and the pandemic um, expose these um, these inequalities, no? And, and groups who are already um, marginalized or uh, minoritized or so on are, are even more affected than than they already are. So thank you very much for your answer. Um, I'll give the floor now to my colleague Adrian at the European Free Alliance Youth. Thank you. Hello, Sandra. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, so um, the, the topic that I wanted to bring to the discussion was that as it's always the case with this uh, impactful crisis, uh, women and girls have been specially affected. Illustrations of this range from difficulties in accessing like beauty of products to also a heightened risk for them, especially minority and migrant women and girls, of being subject to violence uh, due to being stuck at home or due to simply being isolated. Uh, are there any other examples of that? Uh, things you know or have been reported to you by the activities you work with? How do they feel? Uh, are, are their rights impacted so much by this pandemic? Thank you. Uh, this is such an important conversation and question because um, I feel that to the general public, the rise of violence against women and girls is something new, but it's a reality. And of course, the pandemic has just shown the importance of some primary services that have been negatively affected during the pandemic, the so-called frontline services, shelters, hotlines, we have realized that they are just underfunded and we need to develop a proper response towards it. Uh, what is concerning is also the narrative that went out from the one side, the sort of surprise from the general public. So domestic violence exists, rape exists, victims are with their perpetrators. It's not something new, but also a tendency of justifying this rise of violence by saying it's an effect of the pandemic. I think it's very dangerous when we reach the point of justifying informal ways violence and minimizing a problem that has always been there. The response from the authorities, the access to justice. It's quite concerning to see that in the measures adopted by several European countries and globally, access to justice was to some extent um, redefined in the minimum uh, of like criminal cases. What, when we know that also civil cases are extremely important for the protection of women to be saved by their abusers. Um, 
I will start by saying in Italy during the pandemic and the lockdown, a horrific case came out of revenge porn in Telegram. Six group, 20,000 participants sharing pictures of minor, young women and women generally in a horrific buying and selling of pictures and videos showcasing rape and abuses. Now, the good thing is that an investigation has been opened up, but revenge porn has always been a problem in the European continent. And I'm still wondering what are we expecting to build a strong legislative framework to make sure that even in the digital space, especially women, we know it happens to men as well, but women are the primary victim with girls are fully protected. And along to this, um, in the sector of migrants and refugees. It's not a reality of girls, adolescents, young women, and women living constantly with their abusers. We often heard this justification as a cultural way. Uh, you know, women do not want to divorce because it's their cultural background. They don't want to leave with their abusers because it's a traditional aspect. This requires a lot of work, a lot of frontline service, a lot of psychological support. And unfortunately, we have seen a catastrophic response in terms of frontline services, not just in Europe, but in other continents. Um, I take the example of the African continent because I'm more familiar with it. Um, Nigeria is currently in a state of emergency, for example. Uh, rape on six months, infants, four years old, there is a massive rise. And unfortunately, the narrative and the reaction of the public is not as we were expecting. We always try and tend to find a justification to such horrific episodes. Um, luckily, uh, the activists, the people we work with, uh, women, uh, have been able to use the only mean that we have now, which is uh, social media. Uh, we have seen that young people now are relying a lot on social media to disseminate information. And we have seen a lot of these cases and people denouncing, asking for support. But we need to think more than analyzing the problem, what's finally the concrete solution? And the first one is that we must fund frontline services. We must fund shelters for women. We must fund hotline services. We must fund pro bono lawyers, along with translators and all these services for the most vulnerable one minority groups, uh, which often are not in our analysis. Yeah, I would. I, I absolutely agree with uh, what you mentioned, Sofia. Um, if, if only I could simply to, to sum up with what you said, I think that um, the conclusions that we want to take from this pandemic is that this whole bunch of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, essential services, frontline services that were overlooked uh, for so long are, are finally being appreciated by societies, I would say. And it would be very beneficial for all of us that this is not simply a, a short, short case scenario in which uh, you know we all clapped at eight o'clock, but uh, hopefully it will go and you know, have a lasting effect on how we appreciate social effects. And if I can only add um, also that we, we, as you mentioned, you know we don't see all these huge violence that particularly women are having uh, are suffering. Uh, it's not a collateral damage of the pandemic. But, but rather is, is a, a disease that was present in the society and the pandemic is just highlighting it. So hopefully, I mean, sadly, since the, 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 it's increasing, but hopefully this can be used as sort of as an attention uh, breaking point in which uh, deeper change can happen. Thanks. Thank you. Um, due to the crisis that we are all currently experiencing at the moment um, at the Computers Foundation, we're trying to shift our focus a bit um, to analyze the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and try to think about what the middle to long-term future of Europe might look like, like after this crisis. Um, do you believe that the focus of the young women activists you work with is also being changed by the, the pandemic as well? So, for instance, are they now looking into new issues or looking at certain issues with a new lens uh, due to the, to the current pandemic? 
Thank you. I will start with the new land. I think it's extremely important to highlight that it's a global emergency, so we now need a global response. I think when we work with women, especially violence against women, and that's something that has guided personally my work, but also the work of my colleagues, is that you cannot aim to the liberation of women if you don't see it in a global perspective. And now this global pandemic has finally brought several actors to think borderless, to think more globally, to show solidarity. So if there is a change we are doing is shifting this less into an European perspective, but more in a global perspective. And I believe that all civil society organizations should see it in this lens. In the European perspective, indeed, we know that the European continent is trying to support Latin America, South Asia, Africa. And what's our role in this support, in this distribution of funds? But even more, um, what's our role in holding accountable for the constant violation of human rights that has happened and still happening despite the global pandemic. I want to be honest, we have uploaded the decision of Saudi Arabia of not bombing Yemen until the pandemic doesn't go away. Where is our work to make sure that Saudi Arabia completely stops in bombing Yemen? And how can we organize um, as a European organization, but more generally as global organization, to put our effort in these countries in where is currently taking place a humanitarian catastrophe. I mean, I'm based in Italy. I'm in one hour and something from Libya. Libya is completely collapsing. We know we had, there is a migration crisis. We know that young people do not access job opportunities. Has been a decade of bombing, a decade of conflict and we are seeing the same in these so-called post-revolutionary settings. Tunisia, it's a democracy, but yet during the pandemic, a lot of youth activists have been detained because they were holding accountable their government. Algeria, there is a huge momentum following the Iraq. However, we don't have an accountability mechanism. And the result is that a lot of youth activists now are detained. And even in the European perspective, we have seen a point without not that much solidarity we have seen Spain and Italy left behind, not fully supported. So are we truly learning the lesson from this global pandemic? Are we truly learning that our system is weak? Are we truly learning that if we come together, we can really build a sustainable system aiming at not leaving anyone behind? So um, I think we are adopting a more radical lens a more radical lens that goes beyond analyzing uh, migration and refugees, but having a more broader conversation on women's rights in Europe, having a more broader conversation on women's rights globally. And this is peculiar for youth engagement. Um, more and more organizations are meaningfully involving young people, and this is great, but we are still leaving some of the young people behind. Uh, we are still having these layers of uh, discrimination, uh, young people with disabilities, um, migrants, refugees. Uh, we need to build a more uh, comprehensive system and get a little bit creative. I think the fact that I love the youth space is that young people are able to organize despite the lack of resources and they don't follow the box, but they find meaningful way to engage. So, um, the new lens is this, uh, influencing the spaces, uh, the, the existing spaces, and make sure that we send clearly the message out. We want to work with you and not against you, but you need to make sure that uh, it's it's a more um, organic way of working together in a global perspective. Uh, otherwise, we are leaving countries behind and the system will inevitably collapse. Thank you. I think it's interesting that you highlighted that the pandemic and its consequences also actually provide us with opportunities to, as you were saying, think more creatively, think more globally, um, get more youth involvement as well in all of these issues that we, we have talked about previously, because we 
we tend to think of the the post COVID nineteen um, future as uh, very gloomy and negative, which it is in many ways. Um, but it also presents us with with an opportunity to to think a bit out of the box and um, and try to be more inclusive as well in the way we tackle global problems. Um, so I think that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and this concludes our conversation for today. Thank you all very much for your participation. And most of all, thank you to you, Sotva, for your time and for your insights on, on this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sotva. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers for watching. We hope that you have found this conversation inspiring and interesting. And if you have not yet watched the first episode of this series, it is still available on our social media channels and our website. And our next conversation will take place with Lucia Carneluti, who works with school student unions across Europe. Until then, take care and goodbye.